And then I've just realized all the bad stuff starts with the sea, like climate change, consumerism, oh, yeah. colonialism, capitalism. capitalism. <laughs> Terrifying in a fun way. <laughs> My name is Lena. Welcome back to a series I've started on my channel called No Books on a Dead Planet. Um, my thoughts behind this series was that I am personally an, an avoidant person in general, to be honest, I procrastinate a lot. And particularly when it comes to the climate crisis, for some reason, I can't get myself to act like there is a crisis. Um, I freeze up a lot. I'm very bad at having conversations about it, uh, but I'm trying to be better at it. This is a series where I tackle the books that you might be squeamish to read. I am personally squeamish to read, but I'm bringing a lovely, friendly, intellectual person along with me to read it with me and make me do it. We're we're gonna have really cozy, friendly chats about what we've read in the books, and hopefully it will either inspire you to read the book or at least hear some of our thoughts about the book um, so you can get some of that information by proxy. My guest today is Ash Tanya. Hello, welcome to Ash. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's so nice to be on. How are you doing? I'm excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. You are the second guest um, and um, I'm really excited that it's you. Um, I've been a fan of your channel for a while and I saw on Instagram that you were reading this book. Yes. And I also had just bought this book but you had not yet had the courage to pick it up as is classic with me. And I, so I messaged you and I was like, Ash, would you like to buddy read this book with me? Please make me read it. And you agreed. So thank you so much for coming yeah, on. Yeah, you were like, would you like to read it with me? And I was like, oh, I've, I've read it already and you hadn't even started, so. <laughs> I know, but now look, I've got post-it notes and everything. Ooh. Look at me. I feel very accomplished. Um, Ash, I'm, you, I don't know how you'd like to introduce yourself. So would you like to say a little bit about what you do on your channel and who you are for anybody who hasn't yet encountered your incredible work? Yeah, um, I'll just give a short intro about my channel. So my channel is Ash Tanya on YouTube and I mostly make uh, fashion and commentary, sometimes social commentary or media commentary um, about stuff happening online, usually on Twitter or uh, climate change and garment worker rights esque work. So that's like the best synopsis I could give. It all just comes out, really. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that's where the best YouTube channels start is like you basically start with whatever you're pissed off about. <laughs> and I think that that's, yeah. that's where divine inspiration is. It's in the anger. So um, I think they're bloody brilliant. And um, if you haven't checked out Ash's channel, I'm sure you will after this. That's me giving you the eye. I'm sure you will. <laughs> OK, so the first kind of um, question I wanted us both to ask is like, what was our first impression of the book before we opened it? Um, so for those of you who don't know, this book is called Consumed, The Need for Collective Change, Colonialism, Climate Change and Consumerism. And it's by Aja Baba, who is big on Instagram, <laughs> among other things. Um, but that is how I first encountered her work. Is that the same for you? Yeah, uh, so I first encountered her, I think, as a recommendation along the, yeah, around the start of the pandemic, maybe summer-ish, um, and I was, uh, it was someone else sharing, like, fashion influences they liked on Instagram, and I started following, so my familiarity with Aja's work was just through her Instagrams. I hadn't actually read um, any previous articles she's written because I know she, her background started in fashion blogging as she does state in the book mm. and stuff so then when I saw that she had a book coming out I really wanted to read it um and you know wanted to order a copy and then I actually small shout out to a small organization called Black Geographers I won a copy in a giveaway that they were doing um and I was like oh great I want to read this and I want to review it and I actually wanted to do a review on my channel but then I've never done a book review before so then when you came to me I was like great I get to <laughs> do it by proxy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm still gonna want some book content. I'm still gonna nag you for the oh, book content. Oh, <laughs> of course. I mean, after you know, learning under your wing today, I feel like I'll feel more prepared. <laughs> um, so I think it's interesting when people uh, uh, who are already experts in their field and already incredible get big on Instagram because Instagram is so well known for really short form content and like kind of snappy things. Yeah. And this is such a complicated issue that when she had a book out, I was really excited. Um, but I wasn't completely sure what to expect. Did you have any expectations before you went into reading it or where they met or? I'm going to be honest and say I was like a little bit, um, I guess, presumptuous or like cocky and that I thought, oh, you know, I follow her and the general stuff she talks about and like 
her Instagram page is sort of infographic-esque sometimes that she'll share like you know these sorts of stats and stuff but I guess um yeah so I thought oh I'll have a general idea of um you know what she's going to talk about and you know with my channel and just my own personal like general interest I thought oh you know I I know I, I know all there is to know about sustainable fat. No, um, I know enough that I'm, I don't expect to be surprised by too much in the book, but I guess um, a lot of sus fashion sustainability content now is Instagram based. Like I've said, I followed her there. So then when it's compiled into this like comprehensive text, it's much more like in your face and t terrifying <laughs> than I wasn't expecting. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> terrifying in a fun way <laughs> um yeah I think as well like what was really helpful about reading the book was that I'd again like seen um some of Aja's work and uh some other people's work on Instagram and and like like you like you kind of said like I was like oh yeah I know, I know that it's really bad I'm not sure how bad but and uh, very bad I mean, I <laughs> and I knew <laughs> yeah and I'd, I'd watched the true cost and stuff so I knew some of the stuff that was in the book but I think what was really helpful about the book was that it it threaded stuff together. It drew loads of dotted lines between things. I was like, ah, oh, okay, those two concepts, yeah, th those make sense together. <laughs> and that's what I think we miss sometimes on on Instagram and stuff. Yeah. Also something that I kind of wrote down from this question I thought was quite funny was that when, like, when there's a book like this, obviously books have usually, like, they have this thing of being like, they're very serious. It's, it's in a book, so it has to be <laughs> very serious. And she's actually really bloody funny. And she has loads of, like, really silly asides. Yeah. And one of them that I wrote down, <laughs> that was, like, like, making me laugh. She was like, she's talking about um, brand deals and turning down really bad brand deals. And she literally writes, do I want to punch myself in the vagina every time I pass on an, an amount of money? Of course I fucking do. <laughs> Like, <laughs> such a visceral image <laughs> so visceral and also like it's like really funny because it's just so matter of fact and it really reminded me of like uh, like kind of US humour that's just like really in your face and like yeah I fucking do uh, but then also like that kind of Britishness of like instead of being like did I want to faint did I want to no I want to punch myself in the vagina <laughs> <laughs> like exactly like, you a can great see the mate. influence of because I think she's both UK and US based and you can see that in just yeah. her tone and like her sense of humor as well that you can read the parts where it's like okay this is definitely the uk influence this is a, a bit yeah it's a bit, like you've been living in the uk for a while a bit too long maybe <laughs> just the london clouds yeah, are getting to your head a little bit yeah i love it i love it and um, i think she wrote some of it during lockdown as well so there's definitely that kind of i think that feeling of like that we all had that was like for fuck's sake <laughs> during that period so that definitely comes across so like in reference to the subtitle uh colonialism climate change and consumerism um they're things if, if i'm honest that i talk try and talk about try and learn about but i rarely include them both in the same conversation which i realize is really bloody stupid <laughs> and something that this book helped me like kind of overlap those things and kind of really be able to talk about them together and not leave one of them out if yeah. that makes sense um do you in general do you like have conversations with people in your life about the climate crisis and when you when you do do these things overlap for you or is it hard for you to like put them all in one thought because I, sometimes i i struggle to even bring stuff up with people in my life so to be like i'd like to talk about climate change and colonialism <laughs> you're like not the funnest person at the party <laughs> no, <laughs> you know what i mean no it just kind of it just kind of dies i think my uh s sort of social pool is immediately biased in that like I studied geography and geology and had loads of like friends in environmental science and that sort of stuff so of course they would be but then because I'm like oh of course they would agree on this stuff I guess I'm less likely to bring it up because um it kind mm -hmm. of feels like I'm preaching to the choir but when it does like come up in general like conversation with other people like I might bring up consumerism but not use the word uh, I think, I don't know if you've noticed on my channel, but usually when I'm avoiding like big problematic words with YouTube, I'll just be like the big C and then I've just realized all the bad stuff starts with the C, like climate change, consumerism, oh, yeah. colonialism, <laughs> capitalism, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> and also the four letter word. <laughs> yeah, all of them. So I'll just be like, oh yeah, the big, the big C really like messes us over with that, doesn't it? Or like, oh, do you really need that item though? I mean, it's all just consumerism and marketing that's pushing it pushing it towards us or you know I'll just try and make like slight comments that don't come across as me being overbearing on the other person or um intimidating mm. them or like 
judging them for their choice um but then when it comes to like the overlap of uh all three i don't i i don't bring it up in like general life at all i think that's what my youtube channel is for it's just a place for me to go and and, and rant <laughs> about all the stuff i feel like i can't in which is really bad though because we should be able to um talk to the people we know especially um about stuff yeah i i feel the same it's like there's it feels like there's never really a good time but <laughs> But then you end up never talking about it. And yeah. I wonder what kind of... I know there's this thing in... Um, I'm not sure where they do it, but I've, I've been to a few. Um, well, they do like death cafes. I don't think you've ever heard of this, but because there's this, this positive death movement that's like, we need to talk about dying. People are scared of dying. They don't want to talk about death. Mm -hmm. That's not good. And they set up these death cafes where you can go and like talk to strangers and you get set up in little groups and you're just allowed to talk about death. <laughs> And it sounds really morbid and I watched like a little documentary and I thought it was really interesting and I ended up going to one because there's one at a festival I went to and it was actually really nice. <laughs> but like, it's so, so I'm like, can we not have like climate cafes? <laughs> We're I just, think like, that allowed climate cafe to. sounds good. I don't know about a death cafe. To, you know, for some reason yeah. it sounds like something a life insurance company would set up <laughs> and then while you're in there they send yeah. you an ad for it. <laughs> It would be one of those things that started with really good intentions, but then you'd need a sponsor. Yes. <laughs> and then you'd have to go. Yes. It would have to go dark. <laughs> it, would, it would be It would be the worst. I know what you're saying, like a sort of uh, discussion space to talk about that. But then it's also, how do you, oh no, how do you market it so that it seems like it's open for everyone and you don't attract mm. a certain, again, preaching to the choir type vibe? Yeah, definitely. I think that's something that I struggle with. Is like when I have gone to like climate meetups, I'm I'm preaching to the choir, and I can see that I'm like, okay, everyone here gets it, and it's yeah. not. And like you were saying, you you replace words like when you say like instead of saying consumerism and stuff, you like say other words or like so maybe we need, I don't know, like doom cafe. <laughs> it's a bit sad, isn't it? <laughs> like <laughs> there's got to be something that's like approachable, but also like you will find it if you're looking for it. It kind of reminds me of the struggle we used to have with like environmental campaigns and stuff at uni is that you would just have the same cohort of people in the same types of courses coming in other people not being interested mm. and then with one event example it was sort of just like mass emailed or like pushed to different like departments and then loads of people who normally wouldn't have turned up did and actually enjoyed it and I was like so oh, that's good. how do we replicate that? Just force everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like kind of pop up when they're not expecting it. Kind of thing. <laughs> it's almost like you need like a climate, ca like you need it like tagged on to like every event. It's like, oh yeah, come to the rowing club. And then for 10 minutes after the rowing, you have to talk about this. Or like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know how to solve it, but it's, it's interesting. Like when, when I go around being like, I never have these conversations. Like I don't, there's no there's no space for them and either I need to work out how to make space for them or in, like do you know what I mean I need to recognize why anyway this is just brain farts I'm having uh, oh yeah okay something that actually this is linked to what you just talked about so one of my notes about this was that I, I realized that the book did help me like switch some of my words up um so instead of like third world or developing country I've, I've heard like about the like don't use third world and I'm like yeah that makes sense <laughs> like as mm -hmm. soon as somebody said it I was like yeah why has anybody ever said third world yeah. um but developing she 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 suggests instead of saying developing um countries say traditionally or historically pillaged, pillaged. countries yeah which I thought was really good and I hadn't because I know just like you I knew that saying third world was bad but I didn't realize just the first of all the historical context with the soviet union that she mentions that it used to be called that in because of pro in proximity to the u.s and the soviet union and since that's no longer a thing is redundant i didn't know that's why yeah. the phrase third Neither world existed I. in the first place and i just knew oh you you don't say that i don't know why you don't say that but you don't say that and developing country yeah. to me always felt a bit like insulting because it's like what who has like the scale or the meter to say, oh, we're, de we're like, we're developed at this point or whatever, like who's in charge of that? Um, and I really liked how she pointed out that all these things that um, would, I guess, create the barrier between it being class developed or not is technology and all the technology in the West is 
derived from resources in like again not to use the phrase but in in the historically pillaged places right you see yeah. it's so embedded in language that i'm automatically going to revert to the phrase global south before i have to like correct yourself and which is something she explicitly says in the book as well as like to unpick the language and like correct yourself as as well and i feel like every time i yeah. mention it now i'm going to say historically pill pillaged um countries and then someone will say what does that mean and i have the conversation all over again <laughs> until yeah. that place picks it's up like, but just pass it on <laughs> pass it on this yeah. is the new this is what the cool kids are saying now but i think it also like helps to de like when you keep cha i don't think it's bad that we keep changing our language around things no like, it seems to be happening not. faster and faster because it stops us from being desensitized yeah exactly and that's the mm. thing about language changes doesn't it so it's not going to be you know, language changes, the definition of things change. So I don't see why that shouldn't also apply to when we're talking about um, like col colonialism and stuff, because we're mm. constantly uncovering, you know, the, all the messed up stuff that's happened and is happening. So should yeah. work hand in hand. And I guess that works as well for she talks about um, this word sustainable and how it's been overused. And if I want to try and be in any way positive about that, I'm like, Okay, it means that we're all talking so much and using those words so much that we've become desensitized. So at least we've all been talking about it so much that we have to keep changing our words because we've like desensitized our own brains to it. If I was trying to be positive. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's another thing as well, isn't it? It's like I could say the word sustainability to like 10 people and ask them what they think it means and they will give me a myriad of me meanings, right? Or they could give me the dictionary on first line on google but if i ask them oh someone who works in sustainability what do you think they do or something like that they wouldn't know yeah or yeah. how does it we should be at the stage where everyone is aware of like how sustainability applies to them in their lives and we still haven't scratched that surface yet and instead it's yeah. really been co-opted to to mostly as a marketing ploy by businesses and stuff to say oh we're sustainable and it doesn't actually mean anything yeah it's really frustrating. I, I guess as well, it's like sustain what? Like, because you could be you could be a sustainability activist for capitalism. Yeah. You could be like, we need to keep this shit going. <laughs> it's working for me, <laughs> you know. So I think it's like sus sustains what? <laughs> so one of the like things that I set us because I'm a nerd and apparently this is school. <laughs> I, said, I I said, um, could we both pick like a quote or a point that that really stood out to us when we were reading through it? Mm -hmm. Um, what was your what was your one that you that you picked out? Um, so what what stood out to me, I guess, in the book mostly was, um, first of all, it was refreshing because, like I said, uh, my introduction to Aja was through Instagram and I didn't really have a history of um, her like sort of career and background. And uh, reading about her start as like a student and getting an internship with a like independent brand and stuff like that and really reading what it's like to actually be with a brand that I would assume at the time, like early 2000s, where she was doing this, wouldn't have necessarily branded itself as sustainable, but was doing all the things that, you know, brands are commended for now, like um, reusing scrap materials, like making their own prints using like bespoke like ink or something. I think she described like the dyeing process at some point and how they couldn't afford to discard even like the slightest of scraps because every single thing is like in the mm -hmm. in, in bookkeeping and is counted as a loss so every single bit of uh fabric and labor is like immediately there's an output for it and there's always like util utilization of everything absolutely everything and it kind of made me realize how that is a possible business model so like when we're talking about oh we want this sort of accountability from brands and sometimes you know when I'm talking about it like in videos or whatever I'm just thinking okay but is this actually a feasible thing that's ever happened and reading that was kind of like okay this is a thing that has happened within our lifetime and in the span of 20 odd years we've moved to this fast fashion model where um you know a dress that's been seen on the runway today will be copied and mass produced by next week and then by the week afterwards people on tiktok are wearing something else that's completely different um and then a few chapters down i just starts talking about um the ties between social media and fast fashion 
and I never realized just how like the two are essentially interlinked like you can't separate the two because it's because of social media that we want to keep up appearances and keep buying more clothes and it's because people are pushed to buy more clothes um and they are marketed on social media and so they, they it, and it's like an oh yeah it's such an in sync like supply and demand chain that for what it wants to achieve works perfectly <laughs> and yeah, i guess that was just extremely hard to to take in that this monster is like you you really can't separate the two like at all um and yeah. it's just kind of like mind-blowing to really think about and see like i was saying to see in text uh so i think that was it for me <laughs> yeah definitely and it's it's sometimes like um refreshing but also like just so irritating to realize that we as humans just like chase our tails all the time we're just like we just do the same habits over and over again and we get faster and faster and it's like what and it also kind of reminded me of like you know victorian women who would be like they change for dinner and they'd like change for breakfast and it feels like we have to have multiple outfits a day yeah multiple outfits a week and it's like it is like kind of being watched i guess it's it's uh terrifying <laughs> yeah exactly and except for you know in the case of like with victorian women i am not very well versed on that but i'd assume it's for the more like posh or like upper class people who could yeah, afford the to do real that. whereas fast fashion 3%. is like you don't need or you don't need to be rich you can you know change outfits and like look this way on a budget and you know it's like a whole aspiration thing that ties into like consumerism um and also like I guess class because everyone wants to uh, no one wants to appear poor even though you get into the fast fashion debate and people are like oh we buy fast fashion because we're poor but the people who are buying excess fast fashion are really not oh, oh and I also really enjoyed her definition of poverty because I think a lot of people need so I don't have the exact page number for that I don't know if you do I needed to mark this but 203 203 in your hymn books <laughs> please turn we will see <laughs> when she starts to to give like the proper definitions of poor and working poor um which i think most people usually um change that for working class don't they and i feel like that's intentional in a way but it's like what i feel like working poor really drives home the point she's trying to make m make more yeah but anyway so having substandard unstable inconsistent housing underemployed underpaid and sometimes long-term use of public benefits little access to higher education and chronic lack of health care food or other necessities a tiktok uh video creator who's currently at university on track to make i don't know how much in some marketing job somewhere buying like loads of zara for a hole that they're gonna write off as tax as a tra tax break is not poor <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's because not i guess it's that thing of like you sometimes i think what we're what we're saying when we say like oh that's not affordable when when you're like when you have a lifestyle like you just described is that um i can't buy at the volume that i'd like mm. i can't afford to buy the volume and rather than being like i can't afford clothes whatsoever mm -hmm. i'm going to be naked if i can't you know <laughs> you're right it's really different and yeah. i think like her definitions were really 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 interesting and she she uses her definitions against her own life as well she's mm -hmm. like i don't have any of these problems therefore i don't class myself as somebody who can't afford yeah um, to not buy fast fashion which is really really interesting yeah and i think after seeing her put that example to her own life as well i sort of like did that in introspection of thinking because the reality of it is like with social media it is very easy to feel like you have less than but when you actually like and not to be um because i know this is a very british sentiment isn't it of like oh well it could be worse but I, but in this context i'm just saying to the point where like I've walked into a, a store and I'm trying to justify a purchase that I don't need by saying, oh, you know, it's only the one item I'm poor, I can only afford, like, instead of taking the time to make the effort for maybe a more sustainable option or, like, say I needed a coat or something, it really is important to dial back and actually look at your own privilege. And I, people, that's, I feel like that's another word that's been so diluted now, isn't it, that people don't actually... Yeah, don't yeah, which is why this definition, I think, is very important. Page 203 in your hymn books. 
<laughs> yeah, the one that I, this kind of relates to what you were talking about. The one that I picked out that I was like, I, I wrote a post-it note that just says, oof. <laughs> As in like, oh, that one hurt. Um, she's quoting somebody called Liz. Who is Liz? Liz Ricketts of the OR Foundation. We're on 138. <laughs> if you'd like to follow along at home. She says, fundamentally, nimbleism is the idea that something isn't good enough for me, but it will be fine for you. It is the definition of supremacism. To think that I won't wear this because it has a hole in it, but somebody else can wear it, is literally to think that I am better than someone else, even if the impulse is to give something away um, that is filled with good intentions. However the declared intentions, the NIMBY attitude manifests further injustice. And I, I feel like I have donated so many clothes to charity because I was like, I don't really think this is like, my highest quality item. I think mm. I can like, do you know what I mean? And I'm yeah. like, what a dick, what such a dick. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know I know exactly what you mean. But it doesn't really start off with that, like in your head you're like, oh, this isn't a bad intention, mm. like it'll be like good for someone else or something. But that is the yeah. crux of it, isn't it? It's you, you don't feel like it's a good enough item for you anymore. So you're giving it, so you're giving it um, away and you're just gonna be like, even where you see like, oh, it's not gonna be, or the general attitude I've seen, like, as well, is like, oh, I can't sell this on Depop or whatever, no one will want to buy it, so I'm just going to, like, mm. sell it on. Uh, I'm just going to give it away and hope they do, like, whatever with it. And nimbyism. Yeah, it's that kind of, like, have the scraps from my table. <laughs> and it's like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah um so i think that i think like my attitudes to charity shops and stuff have changed like in the us i know like thrift shops are slightly different in the way they function to charity shops i don't yeah. know if you've kind of, like, kind of come across that it's like when i read a lot of stuff around on the internet around thrift shops i'm like i don't know how much of that applies to the uk no I don't because know if you know more about it than me because our system is sort of like the whole like, like some thrift shops are like for profit aren't they Whereas mm. here, I think with the charity shop is like usually tied, like it'll say like Haven's Hospice or it'll say um, yeah, Mind or and it'll it's like... say what it's for, fundraising for and stuff. And sometimes they will like buy brand new items to sell on just to make extra revenue, but it is usually just functioning on a donations basis. Um, or the occasional, I, ha I have walked into a charity shop one time and they just had... I think it was from an outlet because they had loads of uh, brand new Zara stuff in there. So instead of like charity shop oh, prices, wow. it was like half um, half of what uh, the re like RRP was, um, which I thought, how many more stores do this though? Like, do they actually like, or do they, because with the numbers we have on record of sh stores just throwing away like returns and stuff, do they also yeah. give them away to charity shops or like to shelters and stuff? I don't know. That that was um, one of the facts in this that really blew my mind was, um, so they talk about this place called Cantamanto, which is a yes. marketplace where a lot of the Have you seen the videos of it? To, I've seen one of them, I think it was on Greenpeace website, but it's very brief, but yeah. I don't know that much about it. When I've seen it and when I was like reading about it, it reminded me of um, back home. So um, I'm from Zimbabwe and there, my introduction to secondhand clothing was through not as drastic as Cantamanto, but like those sort of like secondhand clothes that so all the secondhand clothes that don't make it in charity shops and thrift shops in the US or wherever will be shipped to like historically pillaged <laughs> regions of the world um so for example uh, the closest i guess port to zimbabwe would be in mozambique so loads of people will buy them in bales which are then mm. called um in colloquially mabero like from bales so people will buy those bales of clothing not knowing what's in there just knowing that this bale has clothing from whatever country with whatever and then they'll come it they'll like be driven in to whichever country so loads of countries have those markets of like reselling clothes and it's literally just the so my first like thrift secondhand experiences weren't as like curated and like on hangers in stores here in the UK you're literally just going through piles and piles of um clothing um and you know you can find like 
brand new stuff you can find things that are clearly like been worn before but it's all like in these large compacted piles and then i've always wondered like so what happens with the stuff they don't sell because they used to get them i think i used to know that you can get them in i think it was every tuesday or something so they would get these bales every week um and this is right. like so this is one mar one market that does this in my town and probably in every town and probably in every country in southern african region and this is happening also in like uh is cantamanto in not kenya it's in ghana i think ghana is it? so that's happening let's assume in 40 plus african countries wherever in asia wherever in south america mm. and there's still more stuff being made <laughs> and there's still more stuff coming out and it's working on that fast fashion cycle because it is still do you know what i mean it's that it trickles down it's on that month, that weekly basis which i didn't realize that's yeah. interesting and when you think about just like you're saying it's still the it's still the nimbyism though isn't it because it's like the stuff that the charity shops have decided they don't want is going to be shift in fact it's not even directly from the uk i would say because i think uk stuff from something i've read before uk stuff will first go to like eastern europe and then to africa so right so it goes through. so it goes through like this whole like you know clothes that have traveled more than i have really <laughs> they've really seen the side <laughs> they've really seen this and then if they don't make it at their last de destination so whether that's like back in my hometown or in Cantamanto or wherever then they're going to end up in a landfill somewhere and languish for you know and it's that linear cycle of how how long is it going to take for it to get to the end of the line but it's just like a line and there's no it's not circular as we would want it yeah. to be a circular um economy and like with the markets that you've been to like what's the atmosphere like are people going in and like looking for specific things or are they kind of just they're there to peruse and like just see what they can find or what's the it's a see what you can find vibe well it was for me anyway because i would just i was would just be there like oh let's see if i let's see if i'm lucky it, it, this yeah. is actually a funny thought to have because it, it, I was obviously much younger then and be like let's see if I'm lucky enough to find something that's like trendy now and sometimes you would right. which is very worrying because that means someone's bought this new t-shirt off Topshop or whatever and in yeah. the span of however long maybe a month it's already made its way down to wherever yeah you're like how did you get here <laughs> how, did you, how did you get here like I remember specifically this one uh crop top i got which i had for a while until it eventually i think ripped or something it was like a crop top shorts set that was like purple in the front and i think after looking years later it was from shein and that was before people were as trusting of shein now it was like when people were still like oh there's this really dodgy company called shein but if you wait a few weeks you might get a nice like item and i've got that in what would have been maybe early 2018-ish and then when I looked up because so I would look up to see the item I've got where it's come from and it must have been up on the website maybe just a few months before then which is like mm. concern it's concerning isn't it yeah it's scary another thing that like Aja says to do in the book she's like wherever you are right now go and look at your labels of the clothes like where are your clothes from the ones that you're literally wearing right now and she does a lot of like actions like that doesn't she she's like yes one of the facts that i'd written down from that about the the this specific cantamanto market is that 25 percent of the shipping containers received in cantamanto are free t-shirts so you know the ones the conference like the ones you get for conferences or like football teams yeah. or like do you know what i mean like the charity run t-shirts and i'm like oh my god do you like, remember how many those ones. i think i remember specifically i can't remember his name now but the guy who's like one of the main uh love interests in jane the virgin the guy who plays that character i think he oh, yeah he i used to follow him a lot on instagram for some reason during covid because he was doing loads of like i mean yeah but then he <laughs> had like this weird campaign going where it was like you could buy a t-shirt that would then like fund like i don't know healthcare or was it pp for healthcare workers and i was like why wouldn't you just ask people to donate directly to yeah why do i need a t-shirt as an incentive to do this a t-shirt that will make no sense in any other context because i think it had like a very specific uh caption on yeah. it but i think that happens a lot isn't it that people are like oh buy this t-shirt to fundraise for yeah 
whatever, whatever. And then they make too many of them. Yeah, and it's not even like the ones that you take home and then you sleep in for a while and like you may do the odd like workout in. It's the ones that you don't see because they literally never get given out and then they're just... And I... No, and another thing as well is like tote bags are becoming a problem because, like, because mm. for things like whether it's university open days or it's conferences or whatever, you just go, oh, like here's a free tote bag and then they have so many of them that have like specific dates for a con conference or something so it's like not usable for anything else but they're literally like built to to date (laughs) they're literally just like this is this it's kind of like i remember at uni i'd have like like we we had like t-shirts for like going on holiday (laughs) i'm like what 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 the hell was that (laughs) like it was like i literally was like tenerife 08 i've got a t-shirt that says that somewhere and i'm like it makes sense for some things right like you have a hoodie saying oh like class of whatever but then you wear that forever Mm. because it's you know like memories of your high school or whatever but yeah for everything there has to be a t-shirt <laughs> yeah and there's definitely like a lot of surplus floating about this that's really really mad um one of the questions i had was would we recommend this to other people would it be for a specific person at a specific time in their awakening i guess <laughs> or would it be like literally for everybody like how do you feel about that um as much as i'll say like her writing is like very easy going and like you're saying not very like as formal as the idea of like it's in a book comes across but I do understand that non-fiction reading isn't for everybody um I think I would mostly recommend it to a person who's like in their baby curiosity phase of being like um, I'm not really sure what to do and I'm not sure what to do with all these stats being thrown at me on Instagram like infographics what does it all mean? Where do I fit in the context? Because I feel like, um, because like you were saying, you know, you're connecting all these, whether it's like the stats or Arja's story specifically to your own life. I feel like it's really useful in that respect of like, see where you are through Arja's story. So whether you are still in, in your trying to follow every trend on Instagram page and you're reaching a fatigue point or you've reached the point of like, this is this is enough I'm tired of doing this but I want to you know you can fit yourself in some in somehow Mm. like along the (laughs) timeline but I would recommend it to someone who's just hit that early curiosity phase because I feel like this would have been a really good read for me because it's taken a bit of a while to uh, reach where where I am now because this wonderful resource wasn't there and maybe I also just wasn't a keen reader at the time I don't know yeah definitely and I think I think like it, like I'd I think I'd say the same. It's like it some of it some of she quotes from a lot of different people. So if you don't know any of the resources, then you're like, oh, I'll watch this documentary after this, or like, oh, I'll listen to that podcast. And some of that I've already consumed. But like you said, there's so much that like extra like this. I've just like but my, this is like a map. I don't know. If you yeah, can I can it. see it. Um, and it it's the one that's like um traces the trade routes of the fast fashion industry against the import export routes for colonialism and it's like they're literally the same they're literally and the we're same. still exploiting it's people so jarring, we're not paying it? people yeah and it's literally it's terrifying but that's something that i hadn't seen in the other resources so i think there is stuff in there as well but you're right i think it's like come along with aja have a chat about her life and mm-hmm. then you know work out what part of uh of the journey that you're on and i think what what else is good about it is there's loads of action points and something that again, like I just need telling again, because apparently I need telling like 20 times before I do anything, is like, letters do make a difference. She's a big thing in the end is like, write letters. Like there is, there are rules within companies that if they get a certain amount of letters or a certain amount of emails about a topic, like, yeah, they have to respond or they have to bring it up in a meeting. And I'm like, some part of me knew that, but I really needed a kick up the butt about (laughs) it. (laughs) But yeah, I think that's, um, because another thing I was going to bring up I haven't seen that they're doing it again at any point but there's this um podcast which the name I will send you to send you at some point and the two podcast hosts sort of um had like a zoom community thing where they were writing letters to like big brands and stuff as like collectively yeah. and I think I just shared it on her Instagram as well and I was like it, it it must be very heartwarming to her as well to see like her book like actively pushing people to do something isn't it 
um yeah. and I, I couldn't thought join. That. I was like I should do a zoom with somebody to do to do it with to make me yeah <laughs> yeah I couldn't join that specific one because of like I think it was, I can't remember if it was a time zone difference and I would have been working or something but I just thought it was a really good idea to to do that and it's something actionable for most people I think because you can write it anonymously you can do it from the comfort comfort of your own house but then you're still you know getting um a message out there definitely final thoughts is there anything like do you think like in a few months when you look back at this book is there anything that you'll specifically will jump out at you that you'll remember or anything that you think that you might do after reading it I feel like I've written down I'm like I would definitely write a letter but I only finished it yesterday so I'm like giving myself a day's grace but maybe you can nag me I think it'll mostly serve to me as like a book to because obviously with uh whether whether you want to call it climate anxiety or whether you want to call it climate for climate change fatigue or whatever it is there is a sense of like and you're constantly um engaging with this stuff that's telling you all oh, everything's going to come crumbling down people are in trouble or whatever it's gonna serve to me as like the holy book to say everything that you hope to see happen is possible and it's just about getting more people on board so it's like um a motivator in that sense um and i i'm gonna keep coming back to it because i'm like working my way through all the sort of references and podcasts that, is, that are in here and just the stats of it as well i feel like i'm gonna come back and i feel like i haven't start i haven't started like posting it on my like channel yet as well but it sort of sparked a an idea I've had for like a series for a while where I've wanted to like explore the history of like the supply chains and how everything works and uh, in like regards to fashion and I was kind of like oh who would be interested in that kind of thing and now after reading it I was like you know what I'm gonna start writing this and seeing see how that goes and every once in a while I'll be like what's that thing she she wrote in the film? come back with the like... reference so i know you're making like him of the day jokes but this is definitely a bible-esque text in my life yeah definitely it's got a lot of like references and i would 100 percent watch that series please com please comment below if you would as well but like uh we need that please <laughs> if you want to we will come because i think again it's that like uh, what i think as well as taking away this book like this book isn't a telling off and I think yes. some people like wouldn't would like be afraid that that's what it would be but at the end you don't feel like you've been told off you felt like you've been given a like a really friendly kick up the butt <laughs> and I think it's a really hopeful book in a lot of ways it's not like this is why we're doomed and it's all your fault it's yeah like, exactly I get why you thought that way but I you don't think that way anymore <laughs> I feel like it does a good job of like simultaneously not blaming the consumer which is what we see a lot of isn't it like oh the climate mm. crisis is happening because you didn't turn off the tap when you were brushing your teeth which you should but like you know okay but there's <laughs> some guy over there like profiting off oil anyway no it does a good job of simultaneously saying consumers aren't the only ones at fault like it's mostly big corporations but as a consumer here's what you can do and it sort of gives you a level of uh autonomy to feel like you can do something and you're not just like completely helpless i guess because there's always that risk isn't it of people just being like uh fatalistic and like oh who cares then if it's all just happening to me yeah but then it, that also kind of i feel like acting in that way like so it almost gave me like a kind of bad self-worth because I was like somebody I basically was telling myself that I'm somebody who doesn't care and I'm somebody who doesn't try <laughs> do you know what I mean like oh it doesn't make any difference and I think something that I will remember from it is she said um she talks about like are you like a citizen or are you a consumer because you can't always be both and like which one are you first mm. and that was like really I was like oh because I think sometimes like my right to consume feels like my identity but I rarely feel like a citizen, which, you know, isn't my fault sometimes. <laughs> People are rubbish at leading governments. And <laughs> you're not really making me feel like it's a big family <laughs> here, Boris. But like, you know, like it's like, I, I do need to like cling to my identity as a citizen and like maybe not think of my right as a consumer. Like, I don't know. I think there's something, and maybe there are two C words that are... <laughs> 
again. The C words are It's always the C words. It's always the big C. There's the big C, there the are the little C's. And after dealing with all the C's, there will be cake. The best C. <laughs> the promise of cake. Here endeth the sermon. Um, thank you so much for being here, Ash. You're bloody brilliant to chat to. And um, I hope that people will see that we can have loads of jokes and laughs while also talking about the serious stuff. Yes. Um, where can people find you? So people can find me on, uh, I'm assuming this is on YouTube also, um, as Ash Tanya. And I'm also uh, on Twitter if you would like to hear mundane updates about my day at Spinelli Ash. And I'm also on Instagram as Ash with a double H underscore Tanya. All the places. Perfect. And next month we are going to be reading Braiding Sweetgrass with Levi of Levi and Leah and Future Proof. I'm very excited about that so if you do want to join in that's the book we're reading. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom and thoughts. No thank you so much for having me. And thank you everybody for watching and having a difficult conversation with us. If you want to think about the climate there's more videos here. If you want to take a break and think about some other stuff there's some videos here. Here's Ash's channel. Just click on that. Fun times all around. Um, thank you so much for watching frog snog out Ugh, i'm gonna reach over now <laughs>